But Eric, does this get us any closer to helping the individual practitioner decide which agent of these two to get comfortable with, which drug to use? Or is this another piece of the puzzle but still not a complete story? So Dan, I think what this provides us is the, the option of using one or the other drug in the frontline setting. I don't think we have any data that one of these drugs is clearly superior to the other from an efficacy perspective. Mm -hmm. What we have is we have two agents that are somewhat different mm -hmm. uh, that uh, provide good efficacy, um, have reasonable toxicity profiles, and I agree with my colleagues that what we need to do is we need to learn how to use them, but I don't think we can say one's better than the other. Okay. Okay. I, I can't let you guys off the hook just yet, though. I got, I got to know. So how do you decide who, you know, who do you give a pazopinib to and who do you give sunitinib to? So I can, I can tell you what I do in my office, in the practice, and, and it's hard to build that into the context of a, of a trial. Um, so a, as the data with COMPARS was being generated, there was also data emerging in the literature that suggested that there might be some alternative dosing strategies for sunitinib. And, and obviously you can't build that into the trial. So in my practice, when I start a patient on sunitinib, and I'm trying to do exactly what Tom spoke to, which is to maximize dose over the course of time, but maintain quality of life. Um, I used to dose modify first when they couldn't tolerate. And that was because you went from the package insert from 50 to 37 and a half milligrams a day. Now what I do is I actually change the schedule. I change the schedule from a four and two at 50 milligrams a day to a two and one 50 milligrams a day, as reported by Bjornsson from the University of Toronto, suggesting to me, at least in my practice, that there might be some alternative dosing schedules that allow the patient to maintain quality of life while certainly maintaining dose. And I think we've all seen with sunitinib that the patients tend to hit the wall, so to speak, kind of third and fourth week. And, and so COMPARS was, is great because it's a package insert comparison of two drugs and their dosing schedules, but in practice, we have some alternative dosing strategies that we can use. And Dan, I think that's excellent comments um, from Bob, and we're lucky to have two investigators here with us today, um, Brian and Eric, who at GU ASCO this year kind of did a, a look at this retrospectively at both of their institutions, and maybe they could share um, sure, findings. I'll go. I mean, we had a, a smaller experience than Eric. We looked at about 30 patients where we did just what Bob said is, is we said patients would come in and give the classic story of first two weeks I'm fine, third week it starts to go, and then by the fourth week, you know, I'm, I'm really affected. Right. And so, you know, based on uh, data that Eric and others have reported, we started switching to 2-1, and we've really started to switch to 2-1 much earlier. You know, at first it was months into it, you know, then a couple months, and now first cycle almost for many people. Um, I'm, I'm, we're not yet starting people on 2-1. Uh -huh. I mean, it's not in the label. It's not what the large trials show, so I think it needs further prospective study. Um, but at least in our hands, it seems to reduce the incidence of grade 3 toxicity substantially. Yeah, that was our, our, uh, our observation as well. So probably around four years ago, we started switching people from schedule with the idea of maintaining dose intensity, changing the schedule, mm -hmm. And it evolved to us actually giving patients this in the front as, as the first option. Mm -hmm. And uh, we reported at, um, at a few uh, symposia that uh, that group of individuals clearly has lower toxicity. And, and there are some very interesting efficacy data as well with regards to, to how well these people do long term. Now, these are retrospective data. We can't actually make any statements about it. But the bottom line is patients like it. Right. Right. And I think, I think one of the keys for the practitioner, and we'll talk about this over the course of this conversation, is clinical trials are ra rather restricted in what they can do in the context of a, of a prospective trial, mm -hmm. such as the COMPARS trial, and that adds value in terms of results, but it also adds challenges in terms of application. Mm -hmm. and, and many of us have learned kind of in the pits, in the office with the patient, and they've told us, they've told us how best to care for them. And I think what Eric and, and Brian are speaking to is really the patient speaking to us about when the drug starts to produce the side effects that cause them to change their quality of life. But the paradigm, which has grown out of a decade's worth of experiences, maintain dose wherever possible. And what we've done is rather than the old chemotherapy days where it was dose reduced because of toxicity, we maintain dose by looking at alternative strategies.